It's making me wait. <laughs> we learn how to be patient on Zoom. We sure do. Let's see, we're doing it backwards today. There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, like Darcy mentioned, my name is Rebecca Zeitlin. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the crisis line director for D.D. Hirsch's Suicide Prevention Center. So I'm here really to talk about what 988 is and what does that mean to the community? So before I do that, I just want to quickly just give an overview of what D.D. Hirsch and the Suicide Prevention Center is specifically as it relates to the crisis line. So we are the largest and most comprehensive suicide prevention center. Um, for those of you who live on the west side, which I assume is everybody, uh, we're in the heart of Century City. So we are at Olympic and Century Park West. I'm sure a lot of you have driven by our location. We are a member of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network, which um, means that we, when you call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, you get transferred over to the most local crisis center from your location. So we are one of the largest centers in the nation. There are over 180 centers that field calls from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. In 2021 alone, we took over 137,000 calls, chats, and texts. Not only are we available 24 seven for people in crisis um, or having thoughts of suicide, we're also available for individuals who are worried or concerned about somebody. Maybe a loved one or somebody they know is having thoughts of suicide and often we don't know what to do or how to talk to this person. So we also provide that guidance to individuals who are worried about a loved one. Um, additional to that, we're 24 seven English uh, and also 24 seven Spanish. And in the evenings from 4.30 to 12.30, we have Korean language counselors. Now, while we have staff members in each of those languages, we also have the ability to phone in a translation service so people can speak of any language, whatever they're comfortable with, and ensure that we can give them the right support of what they need. So additional to being available 24 seven for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in English and Spanish, we're also one of three centers that is a, a disaster distress helpline center in the nation. So that means when there is a human made or natural disaster, like active shootings or any kind of uh, natural disaster like tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, we have a line that's available 24 seven for people who are experiencing those, um, the, the, those disasters and we provide them emotional support and resources. So now really to focus on what 988 is, so on July 16th, 988 will officially launch. So 988 is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So right now, the phone number to reach the Suicide Prevention Center is 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. But as of July 16th, people can simply call 988 and be connected directly to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So like I mentioned, um, the 800 number is not gonna go away. We don't want callers to be used to calling that 800 number and reach no one because we understand that not everybody will know about 988 right from the start. So these two numbers will still be parallel to one another and will both provide an access to care as it relates to uh, crisis line work. So 988, so 988 is the first three digit number dedicated to mental health and suicide crisis. So in 2020, it was approved by the FCC and Congress, which as somebody who's been with the crisis line for gosh, well over a decade, it is very exciting to have the government and the FCC identify and realize how important the work is that we do on the crisis line. So as I mentioned, it will be implemented July 16th. And the call volume is anticipated to increase by three times. So triple the volume in the first 18 months. So we wanna talk about really quick what 988 is and how it's different than 911. So the goal was to have a number similar to 911. So people in crisis who don't necessarily need emergency services or hospitalization, we wanna ensure that people are speaking to the resource that really is what they need. Oftentimes when people call 911, and they're in some kind of suicidal crisis, they don't necessarily need emergency services to be dispatched and hospitalization. 
So our goal is to ensure that there is no wrong door. We want to ensure that people have that ability to have an empathic listener, somebody who's compassionate and supportive and can give some support around a safe place to talk about their thoughts of suicide. The goal really is to decrease unnecessary hospitalizations. However, if there is the necessity for somebody to go to a hospital, that of course is always still an option. So what I would love is for the community to really understand what 988 is, to know that that is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that as of July 16th, everybody in the nation can reach a compassionate and supportive person on the other end, as opposed to needing or going to a hospital if that is not required. The end. Short and sweet, my friends. I really just wanted to keep it so that you all can really have an understanding of what 988 is and really open the floor if there's any questions or if I can provide any clarification. Any okay. questions, you guys? Yeah, uh, Vicki, here. Um, so someone is in crisis because they don't know whether they're gonna be able to afford their rent or their food. Does that qualify for 988 as opposed to 211, for example? That is a wonderful question. So if anybody is in any kind of emotional crisis or suicidal crisis, we do encourage people to call 988. Because 988 and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a suicide prevention center, our goal is really to speak to people before they're in suicidal crisis. So if that lack of food is causing a level of crisis, we do wanna ensure that they have an empathic and supportive person on the other end. So I would say, yes, that would be an uh, appropriate resource to provide somebody going through that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? I have a question, Rebecca. What if you are, you know, observing people that are on the street and you may not know them and um, they are having a mental health crisis of some sort? Would that be the place to call or 911 or what? So if you're looking to have somebody dispatched to provide somebody a, like a psychiatric assessment, the 988 wouldn't necessarily be that resource for now. We are working right now in some of the long-term goals is in the next year to two years, we have a one-way kind of line to talk to somebody who might be worried about someone having a mental health crisis. And we will be able to connect right away to be able to tell you, yes, I have somebody who has a local uh, crisis center who can have a bed ready and available for them. So the goal really is to have that continuum of care. We just have to build up that infrastructure before doing so. So I can imagine in the state of California, there will be a lot of communication once we're able to facilitate that uh, referral process. Awesome, awesome. Andy, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is Genevieve. Just a quick question to clarify. So if someone calls 988 locally, it's Dee Dee Hirsch that's gonna answer. Is that, am I understanding that correct? So that is a such a great question. So currently the way the network works, because we are a network of over 180 centers, is if you call 988 or if you call the 1-800 number, you get routed over to the most local crisis center according to your phone number. So we understand and the nation understands and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline understands that there are a lot of people that move out of state but don't change their cell phone number, for instance. So exactly. <laughs> so we identify that Darcy, you would not be contacted contacting us if you don't have a local Los Angeles or some of the surrounding county phone numbers. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is working with the FCC on geolocation services so that individuals can actually be connected to the center that they're physically closest to versus what their phone number is. Awesome. 
awesome. Um, I, is it I, Ivana or Yvonne? Hi, good morning, Yvonne. Yes. Yvonne. Uh, just, <laughs> Uh, just a quick question for Rebecca. Uh, is there, where can we access any printed materials that we can share um, in the community? That is a great question. Because the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline wanted there to be really a slow rollout because the fear was that with that increased anticipation of uh, volume that we wanted to ensure because the centers nationwide are all building capacity because we are anticipating a triple in our volume in the first 18 months. So the Lifeline and 988 has not provided any printed marketing materials yet in hopes that centers can still build capacity because the last thing the network wanted is for the floodgates to open and there not to be enough responders to answer those calls. So um, I would encourage you to send me an email um, I did put it in the chat, but I'm happy to put it again so that if and when, not if, but when the printout materials are available, just as the 800 number is on materials, I can be able to connect you to how to get those materials. That sounds great. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and re-input my email in the chat. Okay. All right, if you have any um, further questions, you know, please put them in the chat. And um, I had uh, just forgot, I'm so sorry, Christine. Christine Morassi Glasgow is our COC or Continuum of Care representative for, for our area, SPA 5. And you have an update, and I so apologize, you were supposed to be first. <laughs> No worries at all. Um, it, it was actually great having um, Rebecca go first um, because that was such important information. And um, um, I just learned yesterday that um, um, working with a, a group of medical providers that we are anticipating a lot of emotional distress from youth um, that they're already seeing firsthand in their offices. And so I think this is going to be a superb resource for for us in our in our community so thanks Rebecca um, um, so like uh, Jersey pointed out my name is Christine Mirasi Glasgow I am the SPA 5 um, representative on the continuum of care board which is um, um, the local board that um, um, is sponsored by LASA and is um, in charge of figuring out how to use the federal dollars that we get from HUD so um, um, it's gonna be a very brief um, um, overview really or update. Um, we are in the middle of making all sorts of, of policies, getting ready for the 2022 competition. We think that um, the NOFO, which is the no, um, notice of funding opportunity is going to come out this summer. So um, um, anytime it drops, we have 90 days from there to respond. Um, um, what we've discussed this, this month, we focused a lot on uh, reallocation. Um, and reallocation is a process by which we take money from existing projects that um, um, are either underperforming or underspending and put it in a pool for new projects to apply. We have had a problem over the years of not using up all our subsidies, especially um, um, around the housing authorities. So um, um, those are specifically the dollars we're looking at. Um, um, this year, we've done something um, a little bit different, really trying to also work with agencies because most of the things are actually out, outside of their control, why they can't lease up at 100%. So um, um, this year, we're able to work with a third party from um, Northern California uh, called Homebase, and they've really come in and helped us work directly with agencies as opposed to the housing authorities and really help agencies figure out how to best optimize these dollars. So we are still in the process of formulating policies around that. We, um, um, one good thing we know we are going to do is allow agencies the opportunity to work hand in hand with them and even appeal ultimately the decisions that may be made to um, um, partially defund them. So, um, um, that's a new development because before once LASA basically made the decision to reallocate your money, 
that was it. You never had an appeal. So we are changing the process to really bring a little bit more equity into that process. Um, um, and another area um, that we are working on is updating our COC governance charter. This is a community one process. Actually right now it's out for public comment. So please um, um, log on to the LASA website, um, um, find the draft uh, governance um, um, charter and give your input because this is how the continuum is governed. So it would be very helpful to do that. Then there's gonna be kind of an annual meeting or a general assembly of all agencies on um, um, July, June, 8, uh, June 28th, that's gonna vote on the new charter. So, um, and we, we need to do this every year. We have not been doing it for the last like three years because of COVID. So those are the updates and I'll take any questions if you have any. Any questions about that? Funding types of questions or process? Daniel. Yes, um, thank you, Christine, for that report and the update. Mm -hmm. um, I'm uh, Daniel Tam. Uh, as the SPA-5 representative for the continuum of care with LASA, mm -hmm. um, are, are you involved in these decisions of this allocation of funds? Or isn't, isn't this a broader context of uh, either LASA itself uh, in conjunction with other LA County entities doing this? Or if, if there's a brief answer to that, I, I welcome it, just for my oh. clarity. Yeah, yeah. I know there's so many funding sources and so many different tables that where decisions are being made around allocation. So the table I sit on is only focused on continuum of care funds. And those are the funds that come directly from HUD that go to local communities. And Los Angeles gets about 150, 165 ish um, annually. It's a competition. And so um, depending on the year and how we compete, we get anywhere between 140 and 160 uh, million dollars every year for homeless programs. It's a competition. Interesting. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> any any other questions? If you do have a question and happen to think about it, please put it in the chat, and we will do our best to watch that and get an answer. Thank you, Christina. Really appreciate you doing this, this is a labor of love that you're doing for SPA 5. Um, any changes to the continuum of care coming up? Yeah, um, so um, I just wanted to add on to that, that I will be going on sabbatical starting July. So I'll be gone from July to September. So you will not be seeing me, but um, 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 we'll still be having updates. And so I'm gonna be working with Lassa to make sure that our SPA is still updated on, what, on what's happening. And I will see you all in October when I come back. Awesome. You will be missed. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> all right. Well, we also have, and thank you so much, Rebecca, for your presentation. Um, we also have the privilege of having Captain Patrick Nolte. And um, he heads up a um, Santa Monica's pretty new community response team which is an alternative to calling 911. So um, Patrick, go ahead and take it away. You're, you're a co-host in case you need to share your screen. Okay, perfect. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen and hopefully this goes well. Okay. Is everybody seeing my screen here? Yes, perfect. Okay. Perfect, off to a good start, all right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Patrick Nolte. I'm uh, one of the captains with the Santa Monica Fire Department. Uh, I have the privilege of uh, supervising a very uh, unique and interesting pilot program through the fire department called the Community Response Unit. Um, what the community response unit is, it's a pilot uh, that the city uh, has uh, funded for uh, two years. We're just coming up on our first year and about to start our second year. Um, and like, like you mentioned, Darcy, it's, it's an alternative response to um, you know, highly specialized calls for service. 
Um, and to give you a snapshot of, of you know, kind of what we do in the city of Santa Monica as far as the 911 based uh, response system goes. Uh, if you look at the screen here, our fire department, which provides all of our paramedic services as well as you know, fire responses and really any other emergency uh, frontline response, um, the fire department goes. So we have to be equipped to handle really any situation that comes at us. Uh, last year, we had over 16,000 911 calls for service, and those are a wide range of emergencies, as you can imagine. Um, but one thing that's uh, interesting within Santa Monica is 18% of those calls are homeless related. And that, uh, as you can see, uh, 2,667 calls homeless related. Um, and within that data set, if you were to, to drill down even farther, um, it's a myriad of issues, um, but predominantly uh, it's a request for services that uh, you know, folks at the time, they need uh, some level of care, whether that's emergency medical care or something uh, less urgent, um, from what we have found. Um, the way our model is built uh, is for, you know, those high acute emergent situations, car accidents, uh, heart attacks, fires, rescue responses. Um, our members are trained and equipped to arrive, handle the call quickly. Uh, the way our, our, um, our uh, policies and procedures guide us, especially when it comes to medical care, the only uh, option for us is an ambulance ride to the emergency room. And by and large, in these uh, special cases, that's, that's really not the disposition that's required, but that's the tool that we have. So that's ultimately what ends up happening a lot of the time. Um, and it perpetuates kind of a cycle of, of the wrong care or the wrong services being delivered to the individual. Um, and it really doesn't help in the situation. So where do we fit in? Um, there's, there's a large group of our, of our 911 calls um, that kind of involve these groups, as you can see, uh, from people experiencing homelessness, vulnerable adults, uh, folks that are high utilizers, meaning uh, their only means or access to care is through the 911 system. Um, we're seeing a rise in behavioral health emergencies, and obviously the same is true for substance use disorders, um, overdoses, uh, things of that nature. Um, obviously, these are complex issues, um, and they find themselves uh, turning to the 911 system for help. So our challenge was, and what we recognized, is we are just not set up to handle kind of the evolving nature of the 911 system. So that's where the CRU comes in. Um, we, we approach this through uh, the idea that we need to have a, an alternate response model that is not the typical fire engine and ambulance with firefighters, uh, paramedics, uh, sending folks to the hospital as our only means to help. Um, and the other thing that we realized was that there's a whole network of service providers out there uh, that we were not engaged with and we were not educated on. And we, we didn't have the tools to be able to help navigate people uh, at the point of interaction to better services or to the right services. So our mission as we defined it was, was basically an adaptation of our overall department mission, which is helping our communities, uh, you know, safety, health and well-being of our of our residents uh, and our folks that, that are uh, turning to us for help. But really what it came down to was how do we turn a 911 uh, interaction into an opportunity to better navigate them to either the right service provider or the right destination, which oftentimes is not the emergency room. Uh, how do we design a resource that can spend the time on scene, not have the pressures of handling the next 911 call um, who was better trained uh, and, and, and their mission allowed them to, to really handle these calls in a very different way and in a much more uh, appropriate way. So for us, <clears throat> one thing we're looking for um, in this pilot program is obviously we wanna get, you know, the folks that are calling 911, we wanna increase the numbers that we're connecting them to specific services. And that is a wide range of what those are. We wanna reduce their reliance on 911. 
for primary care. Um, and we are accomplishing that in, uh, in several ways. Uh, we want to reduce the workload or basically uh, reduce uh, asking our fire engines to to handle these types of calls because that's really not what they're uh, equipped or built for. Um, we want to increase the training that our, our folks have to responding to vulnerable populations. Um, and a big part of that is the team that we've put in place uh, have become kind of train the trainers. And they're out there in our fire stations educating our other frontline providers better ways to handle situations, whether that's uh, educating them on what other options are out there, uh, handling um, you know, behavioral health patients, uh, de-escalation training, et cetera, things like that. And then we're looking at some of the success stories that we're, that we're a part of. So here's our, our community response unit team. This is uh, our first two folks assigned to it. It's Karis and Aurora, both firefighters with our department. They volunteered to uh, be a part of the inaugural group of this, this program. Um, and essentially they, they, uh, they work 40 hours a week. So daylight hours, it's not the typical firefighter schedule. They're, they're kind of uh, given the latitude to do what they need to do. They're not beholden to a specific area of the city. They're all over the, our city. Um, they are uh, paramedics and EMTs. They have paramedic gear. So if they uh, are on a call, they can do a full medical assessment uh, if they need to. They can provide immediate medical care if that's what uh, the case calls for. Uh, but one of the unique distinctions that we were able to get uh, as part of a pilot with our EMS agency was to be able to screen uh, behavioral health patients in the field and transport them to a psychiatric urgent care center, which for us on the west side is Exodus Recovery Center. This is uh, normally not what paramedics are allowed to do. Uh, we went through a process to get accredited and approved. So we have that tool, which has been uh, a huge uh, advantage for us and something that makes our program unique. Um, and then the way it's utilized as far as, you know, how do they go on calls and, and how do they fit in with everybody? Uh, they're out there driving around, um, listening to the radio. And when a call for service comes in, they're able to look at the notes that the dispatch is providing. And they, uh, they basically uh, pick those calls where they can add value or ones that are in their wheelhouse. So they attach themselves to the call. Because they're out driving around, usually they get there first. And oftentimes they're able to cancel the responding engine and ambulance and handle the call at their level, which keeps our other resources available. And because they have been trained and they attend a lot of these meetings that we've never been uh, a part of, they're on a first name or a text or a phone call basis with providers. So what would otherwise result in either uh, no services being provided or a hospital provide, uh, would be provided. They stay on scene, they make phone calls, they try and get to the root of what the uh, situation or, or problem is, and they try and handle it at their level, whether that's connecting them to a service provider, um, getting them to a psychiatric urgent care center as opposed to the emergency room, um, oftentimes they find themselves fixing things in folks' homes. If it's a, an issue with uh, a fall or a lift assist, um, it might be an elderly uh, individual who lives at home who uh, fell out of bed and couldn't get back up uh, themselves. Um, and they, they're able to stay and handle that situation. And then follow up. They've been able to get involved with uh, APS filing reports, doing follow ups, working with other navigators. Getting people connected that otherwise would not have because they're really not on anybody's radar. Um, that's kind of where they've been fitting in and have been uh, providing a really good service to that level. Um, another big aspect of the team is collaborations. I mean, we're all about collaborations. We're not trying to duplicate anything that's going on out in the community. We're trying to find our niche within the 911 system, but we're really uh, finding value in a lot of the partnerships that we've um, that we've established. Uh, and like I mentioned, they're on these calls, they're on these meetings every week, they're, they're learning the system and uh, they're, they're really providing the fire department that seat at the table that we never really had before. Uh, so here's some of our stats. Um, we've just uh, hit our 100 day in operation, meaning 100 service days uh, that we're out there on the streets. 
Um, it's been about a thousand hours. We've had uh, 358 911 calls. Um, we're averaging about three and a half uh, per uh, 10 hour shift that they're in service. We've done 12 transports to Exodus. Um, and we do follow ups to, to determine what, uh, what uh, definitive care ends up happening from there. Uh, we've given out 193 service referrals, and that is a combination of um, uh, flyers, which we have helped produce a lot of flyers that are unique to our uh, service providers in town, um, all the way up to um, calling family, calling uh, other service providers, and making those like direct connections to people, basically saying, hey, uh, here's this individual, here's this person who can help you. Uh, let's have a conversation and see how we can get you connected. Um, engines release refers to how many times we're able to take over the call um, and release the, the frontline 911 unit, 210 times. Um, and we've delivered 15 training sessions within our own department. Basically, our folks uh, providing training, like I mentioned, on um, what our unit's, unit is, uh, educating our folks on what providers are out there, what services, how to navigate these calls, um, which is uh, a skill all in its own, um, how to triage people in the field, you know, determine what their root uh, issue is uh, to help better navigate them to where they need to go. Uh, this is a heat map of where uh, most of our work is. Uh, and if you're familiar with Santa Monica, this is mostly our downtown core our high volume areas, but that's where we're seeing the most calls for service for our resource. One thing that's been really interesting, our folks have been really diving into our own uh, uh, data, finding out who our high utilizers are. Um, and we're, we're getting a lot of referrals from our field providers. Basically they're going on 911 calls in the middle of the night and saying, hey, this person has been calling over the weekend a lot. There's really nothing we can do, but here's our information. Can you help us? Um, and our CRU team kind of takes it from there, which internally has been a tremendous uh, value to us. But here's kind of the breakdown we're seeing. We're looking at 83 folks who have, have really uh, hit our radar um, that are needing a lot of extra attention and special care. 39 are homeless, 37 are housed vulnerable adults, and seven are uh, behavioral health um, uh, patients. Uh, <clears throat> We've got uh, some specifically high utilizers that uh, we're looking at that are calling over uh, 911 over 10 times. We have one individual who's called 28 times in the last uh, 12 months. Um, and we've been working with our human services division and have connected that person to a lot of uh, services. A big part of it was reuniting them with their family, which we've done. Um, we just ran some numbers the other day. Uh, their 911 usage was down 73%. We had that interaction, which um, is good for them specifically, but good for everybody. Um, so that's something that we've really uh, focused our attention on is how to kind of play the long ball uh, on the folks that we're seeing, which what we've learned is a lot of times we're seeing people on our radar that are really not on anyone else's list yet, but are trending in that direction. So I'll share a couple of success stories or, or basically uh, an example of how the CRU, uh, our response now is way different than it would have been in the past. So uh, we had a, a female uh, on the Santa Monica Pier um, one day uh, in the middle of the day who uh, was walking around, uh, obviously having a behavioral health crisis. And she was naked, drawing a lot of um, attention, getting a lot of 911 calls. Our CRU, uh, responded with one of our engine companies uh, and uh, one of our paramedics was able to engage with her. The other paramedics on the engine were, were not having any success um, and pretty quickly she established a rapport with her uh, and the way she described it to us is the de-escalation training that she was provided, she tapped into that uh, and it really worked for her, uh, was able to connect uh, with the woman um, and basically triaged her, assessed her, and determined, hey, this is, this is somebody who would benefit from going to a psych urgent care center um, rather than having to deal with uh, the, the police officers that were there on scene and specifically having to go to the emergency room. So she, uh, she voluntarily uh, went with the CRU team. They took her to uh, Exodus. 
Uh, she was there for several hours and they got her referred to uh, Kedron inpatient psychiatric hospital where she spent several days and um, was stabilized uh, and then was able to uh, get back on medication and then was released based on the follow-up that we heard. That interaction, as you could imagine, would have gone very different, you know, prior to the CRU going in service. Um, another one, we had an individual uh, over the weekend, a uh, homeless individual called 911 eight times um, over a 48 hour period. Our engine company was going on him and basically uh, they, they weren't having any success. They weren't having a breakthrough with him. They couldn't get him to go to the hospital, uh, having negative interactions. Uh, and then ultimately he would just <clears throat> walk away and a few hours later called 911 again in a different area of town. So different fire engines were going on this person. None of them knew that they were uh, all going on this guy. Um, and not till later did we learn that he called over eight times. But on Monday morning when the Syria was back in service, they heard the call go out. They jumped the call. They arrived there. They did their screening and assessment. They said, hey, you know, they, again, they do what they do. They established that rapport. Uh, was, we're able to uh, convince him, like, hey, come with us. Uh, we can get you to uh, an urgent care center rather than the ER. He, he agreed. He went. Uh, again, same, same kind of outcome. They got him stabilized. They got him back on his medication. Um, and then uh, he was released. And we've been checking our, our data. We haven't gone on him since. So, um, you know, it's hard to do the long term tracking, but short term, he was stabilized uh, and was not relying on 911 after that. So, here's one specific incident I'll share with you guys. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but we had an individual who was threatening suicide a couple weeks back. Um, it was over uh, Pacific Coast Highway. It drew a lot of attention. Uh, the highway was shut down for uh, a long period of time. We had our crisis negotiation team from Santa Monica PD <clears throat> was making contact with this, uh, with this gentleman. It took about five hours to be able to uh, get close to him. They ultimately made a grab uh, and were able to <clears throat> secure him and get him back over the railing. But while this was going on, our CRU was there um, with uh, the crisis negotiation team, and they had a plan in place that um, if, if everything was successful and we didn't have another situation on our hands, which we were, as you can see, prepared to deal with, um, we were going to uh, get this individual not to the emergency room, but to the psych urgent care center. And as soon as we were able to, we transferred care, uh, patient care to our CRU team. Um, as you can see in that top right picture, that's Aurora. Um, doing a medical evaluation first. Uh, once we rule out any acute medical issues, they go right into that next uh, gear, which is our psychiatric evaluation, at least from an EMS perspective. They ended up transporting him to Exodus again um, and had a completely different outcome than we would have otherwise had. So it was a really good example of kind of that seamless 911 integration of a resource like this um, and how it fits into the overall system. Uh, we made the news, the, the Daily Press featured us, uh, we had a pretty interesting write-up. Um, there's a link if anybody wants to see it, you can Google it. Um, kind of dives into what the program's about as well. Uh, utility of the CRU, again, towards the end here. Basically, they're, they're still firefighter paramedics, um, and we created it as an adaptive resource to kind of hit all these uh, nuanced areas from 911. So, they were able to get uh, on a couple outside of the, the calls that we typically are, are built for. Uh, they jumped on two cardiac arrest calls and were there like within a minute of the dispatch and had two saves of uh, folks in our community that were uh, in uh, cardiac arrest doing advanced care. Uh, one child at a school had an allergic reaction. They were right out, happened to be driving by um, and they were able to administer the medication very quickly and right in time to help that, that poor kiddo. Um, and then uh, it's an ambulance, and we've had periods of no ambulance availability, and they've been able to step in and, and kind of cover our, our butts in that capacity. And the other uh, interesting thing is when we needed them to, uh, they were the right resource to help with homebound COVID-19 vaccinations, which we participated with. Uh, folks that were homebound could not get to vaccination sites. The CRE was out there um, 
uh, delivering vaccinations uh, to some vulnerable populations, which was really cool to see. Uh, our last slide, future initiatives. We're looking ways to really expand. Uh, so we got a couple of exciting things um, coming up. We're, we're expanding our alternate destination pilot to the rest of our paramedics. So all of our paramedics will be able to do this, which is, which is really cool. Um, we're starting a leave behind Narcan pilot, uh, which is um, new to the county, um, but basically uh, folks that qualify uh, who uh, our, our paramedics are going out on for overdoses, um, specifically uh, fentanyl and other uh, opiates, uh, we're able to provide a leave behind Narcan uh, uh, basically a bottle for the family or friends, for folks that are eligible. We educate them and then we do follow-up. Um, so it's just a, it's kind of a backstop. If something, uh, you know, were to, were to occur, at least the family or friends would be equipped to provide some immediate care before the paramedics arrive to help uh, save a life. And then there's another interesting pilot that we're, the county's uh, uh, giving us approval to do uh, which is a suicide screening and prevention pilot. And it kind of ties into uh, that 988 program with the concept of, you know, there's alternatives to the emergency room and this is one of them. So it's a, a pretty specific screening that we would do in the field. Um, and not every individual uh, with issues of, uh, you know, behavioral health or suicide, um, ideations, not all of them require a trip to the emergency room, which a lot of times is more negative than it is positive. So um, it's a program we're, we're, we're getting uh, trained up on right now, and the CRU is going to be delivering that. But basically, it's a follow-up where we can go back out to a call that we, that we, uh, that we went on the, you know, 24 hours before uh, and do follow-up and make sure that the family is educated and all the resources are given. Uh, that everything's in place to to watch over uh, that individual um, and make sure that they are getting connected to the right services uh, for their needs. Um, and then we're always looking for other outreach opportunities. So if anybody on this call uh, is hearing this and they're like, hey, we, we have an idea on how the CRU uh, could help us or vice versa, email me. Uh, we're always looking to uh, make our pilot and our services more uh, useful and adaptable to the community's needs. So that's basically it. Uh, I hope it wasn't too long, but we're excited to share this, this program. It's, it's, it's going really well. It's new for us. It's new for the fire service. It's new for anything that's happening really in, in the West side and we're excited about it. So happy to answer any questions. Any questions? <laughs> Well, I have a question. Um, how you said that your statistics of the number of calls you get for homeless related um, situations is, did you say 28%? It's 18%. And that's, oh, eight, that's eight, eight, yeah, that's citywide. Um, and it's been holding about around that number uh, for the last couple of years. So now the, the, our CRU, their percentage is, is much, much higher because they're, they're looking for those opportunities to interact. Right, do you know how that compares to like the city of Los Angeles, Venice in particular? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, it, when you look at the city of LA and I don't have those numbers and I don't know that they are tracking it the same way to the same level that we do in Santa Monica. Um, but there's, you know, within the city of LA, there's, there's different neighborhoods and different areas have, you know, different populations, so. Um, that's a great question. I don't have that answer specifically for the West side. I don't know. I, I, the reason I said that is um, prior to where the coalition offices are now, we used to be at the St. Robert Center, which is the beautiful um, Catholic Charities building next to St. Joseph Center, real close to Third and Rose. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Third and Rose was absolutely overrun. And um, there was a break in at the building and um, the, the officer that responded said that 80% of their calls were homeless related. And he might've just been throwing a figure out there, 
but right. um, it, and that was, you know, prior to the pandemic too. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I don't have numbers for LA, but, uh, I mean, it's hard, it's, it's hard to speculate. Well, this is an incredible program and, um, you know, it's, I, I'm so thrilled to hear about it. Um, now, do people contact this unit by calling 911 first and foremost, and then they refer to you or, or can you call directly? Well, so we, we primarily function in the 911 arena. So uh, the, the way we have found our program to be utilized is the primary way is, is when our folks are on duty, they're listening for those calls on the radio anywhere within the city. So if they hear something, they add themselves uh, and, they're, and they're trying to get to that call with the normal response that we would send because it is a 911 call. Um, and oftentimes they're getting there first. And if they, you know, a small percentage of the time, it's something highly acute and they got to jump in that paramedic role and start, you know, doing some real work uh, to try and help save somebody. Uh, but primarily the calls that they're listening for and, and adding themselves to are the right calls that are in their wheelhouse where they're able to release everybody and then stay. A lot of times they're, they're staying on scene for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, which is, you know, for us, that's, that's not how we're typically built, but it's great that they have the latitude to do that. And it takes that amount of time to really uh, help some folks out. Um, but we do get a lot of requests by our, our other field uh, our first responders or so the firefighters that they are on a call a lot of times it's a phone call to the unit and, and they're basically it's like a consult hey we've got this guy this is his issue I think we're going to take him to the ER but is there anything you can think of that we can do and a lot of times it's like hey just we'll head over there we'll be there in five minutes or ten minutes um, and they kind of you know engage in that way uh, the, the SMPD health team which is the homeless liaison program they're they're calling and texting each other all the time. A lot of times, the the health team is out with somebody that they might, uh, you know, be taken to, you know, you know wherever. But they're like, hey, we just want somebody with a medical, you know, eye to kind of look at this and make sure we're not missing anything. So they'll call the CRU out. They'll do a medical evaluation. They'll say, yep, everything's looking good. There's no medical complaint. All vital signs are normal, um, and they can offer you know assistance in that capacity. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay, so let's start. Ariella, how are you? Hi. Um, so good to see everyone. Thank you so much, Officer Nolte. This is um, wonderful. Um, so just a question. Are you available to meet with our organization to kind of do this briefing? Should we take the info from the slides and share it with our organization? Um, I yeah, uh, up, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but there's yeah. people in our organization who need to know this info as well. So what would sure. be the best um, way to handle that? Yeah, just uh, let me know. We're, we're always happy to go out and, and spread the word. Um, and it, it's what I'll do is I could have our, our CRU folks come out and deliver the message firsthand. And it's uh, again, we're all about partnerships and we're all about networking. So the more we can get out and, and Meet people face to face, the better. Um, awesome, awesome. Does that answer your question, Ariella? Step up on second is wonderful. Yeah. So just uh, just email me uh, with your information. Yeah. Anita Bella. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Officer Nolte, for this presentation. Um, it's all was very heartening to hear about uh, <laughs> first response. Responders, you know, taking the initiative to undertake behavioral health training and to be out there because you often are the ones first intersecting with members of the public. I just wanted to ask about formal cross collaborations with other first responders, you know, the police and um, so you're the fire, it's the police and what are the other entities you're intersecting with or formal collaboration. I mean, you're obviously sharing your knowledge. The second question is um, building formal collaboration with uh, both behavioral health providers as well as uh, other community-based nonprofit organizations. 
Yeah, so uh, great question. The first one I'll, I'll I'll talk about the formal collaborations with other uh, service providers, primarily who we find ourselves working with um, is the Santa Monica Police Homeless Liaison Program. That's a daily uh, that's a daily collaboration, oftentimes multiple times. Um, our folks uh, work heavily with um, our internal uh, uh, Housing and Human Services Division um, through the City of Santa Monica, um, because a lot of the you know a lot of the work that they do is is kind of who we refer people to or who we uh, collaborate with to determine hey what's the best resource for this call that we went on or how can we get this person an in-home assessment from, you know, wise and healthy aging or, or whoever might be out there. Uh, and they're, they're a huge um, uh, asset to us. Uh, we find ourselves uh, meeting with a lot of the street teams um, pretty regularly. So the C3 team that's out there, the uh, HMST team, um, our folks are engaging with them. And like I mentioned, they're, they're all on a, on a phone call and text basis. So a lot of times it's just a phone a friend like hey you know do you know this individual yeah i know them hey well we're we're out here with them right now can you meet us over here and, and help us navigate uh this person so there's a lot of that stuff that goes on um some of our other uh collaborations are are kind of i don't say limited but um you know with the specific organizations uh that are out there uh, we met a lot of folks uh, in the beginning of our program um, to, you know, kind of spread the word about what we're doing and also just to educate ourselves on what's out there. Um, and, you know, some of the opportunities to engage are kind of limited. We always like to, to increase that. So, like I mentioned before, if there's anyone that's listening and, and, and thinks that there's a partnership that could, that could exist, please let me know. We're, we're always looking to explore that. The one thing I will say is, is through our scope of practice as paramedics, um, we, they ha we are pretty defined on where we can operate. So as an example, one thing we cannot do um, is engage in like uh, home visits outside of a 911 call. We can't do that level of uh, engagement or outreach, which is unfortunate. We would like to be able to, um, but they, the county looks at us as, hey, you are uh, uh, providers of medical care within this scope of practice, uh, and they keep us within that range. So we're not like a home health, not a, you know, another type of thing. So that's where we rely on, on other agencies who can do home visits uh, a lot better than, than we can. Awesome, awesome. Did I, did I answer your question? Yes, and I was curious about getting, you know, perhaps behavioral health staff on the team. I mean, you know, not just trained EMTs, but actual right. you know, on some level. And yeah, then that, yes. oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that would be that would be great. And there's there are other uh, fire department agencies across the US. You know, there's a handful of them out there that are doing, you know, something similar to us. And some of them do have an embedded uh, mental health component. Um, Within our city, you know, we we have a couple of uh, uh, licensed providers that are embedded with uh, the police department, and that's kind of who we tap into when we need, you know, uh, you know, an on scene uh, evaluation. And then also, uh, I don't have a, a an ETA for when this is supposed to be coming on board, but the county is putting a uh, mental health van in service uh, within the city of Santa Monica soon. Um, they were shooting for July. I think that's getting pushed back just a little bit, um, but that's going to be another resource that would be available to to us to utilize as well. But yeah, I, we're looking to evolve this program, and it's kind of you know we're building the plane as we fly it. So uh, whatever opportunities exist out there, uh, we're we're all ears. We want to make this thing you know as good as we can make it. Would it be too vulgar to ask, you know, what your funding source is? You, have, you said it's a pilot project who's funding it. I would imagine public funding, right? Yeah, it's coming through the city's general fund right now. So um, it, it was for two years. It's, you know, within our, our city's uh, budget cycle. Uh, and then, I mean, like anything else, you know, we're, we're competing for funds like everybody. 
and we have to prove our value uh, through this pilot process. So I, I, I couldn't look into a crystal ball and tell you if this thing is going to even exist in another year from now. I hope it does. Um, uh, and, and we're obviously aiming for that. Uh, but that is our funding source. Uh, we're, we're kind of limited to that. But our, our fire chief and our, our department is looking at ways to sustainably keep this resource going with the, the resources that we have. And uh, we're, we're, we're looking at every angle we can because we, we see the value in it for sure. Oh, I think you can get a lot of funding for this, especially if you're doing cross collaboration. And I think it's well, thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, thank you, Captain. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you kind of touched on this, but um, are there other cities in LA County that are interested in your program? It sounds like a great um, uh, resource. And I'm wondering specifically the city of LA perhaps. Yeah, so um, the city of LA has a few different pilots going on right now. Um, and like I mentioned, every department that is doing something like an alternative response resource uh, is doing a little bit different, but at the same time, it's, it is kind of in the same uh, ballpark. So the city of LA has a, uh, an advanced provider unit, which is an ambulance, but it has a nurse practitioner as one of the members on it. Um, so they have that resource. They have um, another resource called a sober unit, which is kind of the same model, but it's downtown LA. Um, uh, close, close to the sobering center down there. Uh, what their main target is diverting uh, 911 patients to sobering centers as opposed to the emergency room. Um, so they have a couple resources like that. They also have the, the DMH van is in service uh, in the city of LA. It just launched a couple months ago, and that's the same model that will be expanding into the city of Santa Monica. Um, there is a I'm trying to think of within LA County, uh, the, the Los Angeles County Fire Department has a pilot resource uh, operating in the Antelope Valley, which is taking folks to psych urgent care centers and sobering centers out there, uh, kind of the same model as us. Uh, and then they have another one of those resources in the Willowbrook area, um, close, to, uh, close to King Hospital down there. Awesome, awesome. Did that answer your question? Yes, thanks so much. Okay, Jeff, you have a question? Jeff, are you there? There you are. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I, actually, uh, I think most of my questions were answered. Um, I, I did have, uh, when is the pilot program sort of ending in order to, to figure out when this sort of expands? Because I, I think I had a lot of the same questions about what kind of expansion and additional mental health and social service providers you guys were thinking of adding on to the team? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the pilot goes till June 30th the next year. Um, so we got one more year of the pilot. Um, expansion, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to say. I mean, we're still learning, you know, where this thing is best, best utilized. Um, it would be, uh, It'd be great to start thinking about expansion. I'm I'm really just kind of focused on how do we just keep what we have right now because that's a challenge in, in and of itself. But um, you know, in my mind, you know, if I'm, you know, if if I could could do, you know, if I if if I had a blank checkbook, uh, which would be awesome if I did. But um, I I really see this thing going seven days a week. Um, you know, we're we have two people basically, and you know they have their work schedule, um, and we're trying to, you know, squeeze as much as we can out of the forty hours that we have them uh, during the week. Um, what, what I'm learning from from watching them in action, and I've worked the unit uh, a lot myself too, so I've kind of seen it firsthand. Um, is uh, the big the big success of this is 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 the partnerships and having somewhere to take folks. Um, so aligning with, you know, the same hours as a lot of the service providers has made a lot of sense for us. Um, so that's, that's one thing I'm looking at as far as when is this thing most valuable. It's really kind of during that peak surge during the day, um, where we have somebody who we can call and help, uh, refer people to or take people to. 
it would be great if we had access to more alternative destinations. Um, uh, the one, you know, obviously Exodus is limited on, on how many folks they could accept. Um, and that's kind of a limiting factor for us. A sobering center on the west side would be amazing if we had that as a, as a tool to take folks. Um, and then also, uh, you know, access to more casework would be great. Um, you know, for us, our providers are really busy running the calls, but I'm asking them to do a lot of quasi case management in their downtime in between as far as making those calls and doing those follow ups, uh, which um, they're doing a good job, but that's not really what, you know, their, their background is in. Um, having a, a, a mental health provider or a case manager within our team that can handle our sub clients that we're, uh, would be, would be uh, what we would need. Um, but how we get there um, and what that looks like is, you know, for us to determine. Awesome. Any more, any more questions before we close? Uh, um, the folks from Step Up on Second are, are definitely someone you should talk to because uh, they, I think they can provide a lot of stuff that, that you're looking for. Um, they've helped us at Venice Community Housing a lot. So highly okay. recommend getting in touch with them. Awesome. Awesome. I love these collaborations. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for the presentations. This has been really, really important information. And um, you know, again, if you have any follow up questions, you can email me, I can, you know, send them out or I, you guys have put your um, email in the chat, correct? Patrick, did you put your, your email? I, in the chat? I did. Yeah, my email is in the chat towards the top. Okay. And, you know, you can email them directly or I'll just um, forward them on. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for the presentations. Um, if we can get a copy of the PowerPoints, we will also send that out um, just so people have that information to refer to. And, um, and also, Lonnie, if you've got any of the, the links or information, we will send that out too. So you guys are amazing. Thank you for, for showing up and um, working together. These are great collaborations. All right, you guys, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I'm just snagging some info from the chat. <laughs> okay, I am too. I'm copying you. I, I was like, chat. I hope you don't think I have a question. Just snagging some info. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just copying it down into a Word document before awesome. I close things down. Come on. Open I love that you do that because then <laughs> when you join late like I did today, I missed so much, I realized. Oh my goodness, this was really good. Yeah. Super. I didn't even know about how my head spins when I think about, I was just talking to someone, um, just the last few days, just that there's so many resources in mm -hmm. Santa Monica and so many people that want to do good. Cause so many people care, but yeah. keeping it all straight is so like, that's my biggest challenge, especially because I don't live there and I'm trying so hard <laughs> to understand, but yeah. my yeah. goodness. Yeah. There really are a lot of good resources and such you know good people behind them all of mm -hmm. all of this stuff was incredible yeah um good programs i just i just got reminded what it was so we're starting our community health needs assessment that we have to do every three years so we just had our first listening session on tuesday and it was with some seniors at wise and healthy aging and it was so they're so cute i just love that uh -huh. but so yeah. <laughs> first of all i love how they're so like determined and um, we said we know 
so many people showed interest. Um, we said, okay, well, there's a wait list. We'll let you know if spots open. They still showed up and we're like, how can you tell them you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just so cute, first of all, but they had so much to say. Um, they were sharing resources among each other. And there's like, they're kind of popcorning around the room. Like, oh, I didn't know about that. And like, oh yeah, this exists. And, <laughs> and hearing it from them, there's so many resources we have, but how do we let people know? Right. And then it kind of validated my feeling. I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm not, it's not just me just not knowing, you know, they lived there for so long and they see that there's so much out there the city has to offer, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We are currently working on, well, the, the main focus is for food insecurity. So resources mm-hmm. and stuff, we're working with a web developer to create a, a different, a standalone website Mm -hmm. that has but but broader that has all resources that are available yes anytime you make a resource guide and you print it it's out (laughs) out (laughs) yes oh my gosh so true because the programs change you know depending on funding or or they expand or they don't you know yeah there's like a the hours program then they have a little expansion of that one program you didn't know about it you're like right Yeah. So that's one of the things that we're working on because we see this also that, you know, I get calls all the time I bet. about people <laughs> that simply don't know how to navigate the um, social services. Yeah. That, you know, that whole system has been very historically difficult to navigate. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people are just lost if mm-hmm. they're at risk for homelessness. They don't know who to call, yeah. you know, people that are already homeless and they have no idea things yeah. like PR or, you know, where you can get a phone that you can pay, mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't have to be paid for, that you can get one to, you know, keep in touch with a caseworker. Where do you get a caseworker? How does yes, that exactly. work? And it's sad because here we are, we have the internet at our fingertips and we know right. so many people and we're still can be lost. And yep. so you can imagine these people that don't have that. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, it is hard. Then it ends up being word of mouth. And luckily <laughs> a lot of um, the government phones now are smartphones, but mm-hmm. you have real limited use mm-hmm. unless you pay for more and some people can't. Right. So, you yeah. know, it's, it just presents, you know, additional problems. Ugh. So anyway, I, it, this was really good information, yeah. you know, cause that emergency aspect is, it, uh-huh. it is, you know, it's overwhelming the hospitals, as you know, yep. Yep. you know, that people just call because, you know, maybe they got too high or maybe they're, yeah. you know, they just are cold yeah. and, you know, they just want to bed. Yeah. And, um, you know, but then that ends up costing the hospital so Mm -hmm. much. So having some other options for emergencies and emergency resources is huge. Yeah. We're, yeah. We just had a meeting yesterday looking at our high utilizers and by name and, you know, come in 30 times this month or the last two months or whatever. And so we're trying to like get the game plan for these individuals, but it's just, it's so hard and you know we can only tackle a few at a time otherwise again we start stretching ourselves thin and yeah it it is so hard because you know it 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 entails somewhat taking away somebody's civil rights Mm -hmm. when you're you know forcing them into the care that they desperately need for their Mm -hmm. own survival yes you know it's it's done with the the best of intentions, but judges really shy away from that, understandably so. Yeah. You know, but then we leave people on the streets that are suffering so bad mm-hmm. and, you know, fighting every intervention. It, it's just terribly, terribly sad. Yeah. I'll, I'll today, just during the presentation, and we weren't even talking about specific people, but I get like choked up now. I get teary eyed hearing like just the success they've had because you imagine all those individuals you know I'm sitting here like what is wrong with me like well nothing's wrong with me like this is huge the impact you've been able to make you know yeah I felt that same way when he was talking about the the 
guy that was um, suicidal. Yeah. I, and maybe it was a woman, the person. Sure. I heard about it, but I, you know, you don't know who it is. You don't know mm-hmm. the details because they don't release that, mm-hmm. you know, and just so glad yeah. that that ended the way that it did successfully. Yeah. It kept happening. Like this whole presentation, I'm like, oh, so beautiful. Like, so, yeah. you know, people, you know, the lady on the pier, like their dignity, like being restored or being preserved, all of it just so, so impactful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it sure did. All right. I'll All right, Christina. Next. Well, you have a <laughs> wonderful rest of your day. You too. We'll talk to you okay. later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.